The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world where you can offer clients access to local and international investments. A world where you can engage with clients meaningfully, backed by powerful data and insights with mobile-friendly technology. A world where you can build business efficiencies through scaled managed accounts and bulk reporting. And a world where you can get all the latest news, research and insights to spot the changes that really matter. Wealth is more than just money. It's about opportunity and progress. A world of opportunity awaits you at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and the guest joining me here today to deep dive into Ascendium is a finalist for the Startup Executive of the Year Award with CEO Magazine, is a Harry Potter fan and is as allergic to paperwork as I am. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Scott Miller. Woo! Thanks welcome. for having me, Peter. Glad to be here. You're most, most welcome. Now, I'm very keen to dive into all things Ascendium, and there's a lot there, so I want to make sure we cover it all. But just to sort of ease us in and to get to know you a little better, then let's talk about you as a user of technology. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? Yeah, so my partner upgraded me to Memoji. Um, right. So it creates an emoji that looks like yourself. So the emoji that uh, my team and I obviously see from myself is a thumbs up bold emoji. <laughs> and I love that that's an upgrade. You got an upgrade. Yes. Right? <laughs> we all need those sometimes. <laughs> I love it. Now, if you had to delete everything off your smartphone, and of course they all just live on us, they may as well just be sort of embedded in our arms now. Um, if you had to delete everything off and just keep three of the apps on there, which ones would you keep? Uh, quite boring, uh, given I spend most of my life uh, in LinkedIn. So I'd probably keep LinkedIn, uh, my Outlook, and obviously my text message app. Nice. So nice. And I have a very simple phone set up, and those are usually the three main ones I operate on. So a, a semi-smartphone would be yes. what you'd end up with. <laughs> I'm the much Nokia. the same, I think. Yeah, and I get rid of all the complicated stuff. I don't need that stuff. All right. Well, let's dive into Ascendium, shall we? Now, for the listeners that sort of – I think most people will have come across um, the product, but just to give them a sense, let's go up a bit and talk about where it sits in the advice tech space, you know, who you sort of normally are lined up against and sort of what category Ascendium sits in for people. Yeah, so Ascendium is uh, hyper-specialized. It's a point-in-time solution. So mm -hmm. you only use it when you need to use it. It's not something that you use on your daily basis in operating a business. Yep. So we sit within the advice creation realm. Okay. So other solutions that you would compare us to, maybe the all-in-one SOA generators mm -hmm. or a power planning service. Yeah, okay. So anything that leads to the production of advice is when you open up Ascendium. Yeah, okay. And it's, you know, what, I mean, what caused this to happen? What, what caused you to, because I know you are co-founder and you've been there, you know, from day one, what made you want to do the insane thing of going down the tech development path? Uh, so uh, a lot of those listening might know that I used to be a financial planner. Mm -hmm. um, I was with a larger licensee at the time. And uh, one of the things that caused an enormous headache was the amount of repetition in the right. paperwork from fact find to SOA. Pretty much the majority of information had to be manually transposed or as I've heard you use on some podcasts, a human API. <laughs> yeah. um, so across different documentation and that usually led to transposition errors. It mm -hmm. might have missed some key information which will lead to a compliance issue. 
And so I thought, well, there's so many different variations of documentation. There needs to be a way to easily adapt, manage, and curate. There's multiple different data points, but not every technology or document has access to those data points. Mm. So wouldn't it be great if there was a system that could produce the core compliance documents within guardrails so it keeps you in a structured manner yep. consistently and could be configured to any manner of document that the planner wanted? And so the reason I pursued that and my team did as well was it was taking us anywhere from 15 to 20 plus hours just to do paperwork. Yeah. And 90% of my time was spent on paperwork, not even with the client. Yeah. And it's, look, it's an interesting thing because if you put a, a whole lot of planners in a room and got some people from the public to come in and we were all just chatting, the last thing they'd think were that we were writing or paperwork experts. Like we're not, we're not going to come across, like I would say, you know, lawyers, there's a lot of, they use big words. They're really, you know, <laughs> verbose or that sort of thing. That's not planners. We're people, people. So we, we like conversing. We like hearing stories, you know, and it's not about paperwork. That's the last thing most of us like. Like it's it's so counterintuitive, isn't it? It's ridiculous, and yet we spend exactly. so much time doing it. Yeah, like so I think that's why we're seeing like more planners get admin, virtual assistants, and even engage para planning services. And so I think in order to manage all this compliance, you not only need humans, but you mm -hmm. also need technology, and that combination can hopefully reduce that burden. Yeah. Okay. And so for you guys, I mean, we'll get to that in terms of. Wow, all the different ways that advisors might want to see something like that. But how do you find the tension between the groups you're dealing with? Because you've got, you know, the advisor that might be using the tool, maybe even a support staff. Then you've got the licensee. Like, so there's a lot of tension between needs and, and demands. How do you guys manage that when you're dealing with practices? Yeah, so we're lucky that when we first sat down with our CTO, John uh, D'Angelis, and our team, we actually went, okay, well, what was every possible combination or data point that any stakeholder could have asked? So when we were first designing Ascendia, we spent two years speaking with admin, para planners, auditors, BDMs, underwriters, product providers, technology, and really understanding, okay, well, what do they want to see from their point of view? What do they absolutely need? So... If you build a technology just from one viewpoint, you're only going to satisfy that one viewpoint. Mm. So if you try to build it from every viewpoint, it, it does become more challenging. But if you build it in a way that is conducive to the user, so from the planner's perspective, then it becomes a lot easier. So because we had an understanding of the different viewpoints that an underwriter would want to see, what right. information would they need? So that's within our system. What would an auditor want to see? the why, the context, where do we place that? How do we make that easy to transfer? So we spent two years understanding all the data or the viewpoints that each one to see and then built that into the back end of Ascendium. So right. depending on the user who is logged into Ascendium, Ascendium dynamically changes. Yeah, okay. And so which is a is actually a way that a lot of the big, even um, bigger sort of uh, productivity apps or all those sort of things out there now in the wide world start doing because they recognize we've just got to have the information all in one place and then we can give you different windows into what you need to see. It's about getting that data or the information correct and accurate and updated and then all, all you need to do is have that particular, whether it's a dashboard or a, a window into the tool um, and everybody's getting what they need, you know. Uh, it doesn't need to be a different tool entirely. Yeah, and I think it's about... Um bringing those different viewpoints or stakeholders along the journey. Yeah. Because obviously we've been in, in an industry where we do have a lot of legacy technology, which mm. hasn't changed in 10, 20 years uh, for some of them. But with the rapid pace of like easy to build, low code, no code solutions, you're seeing a rapid expansion of new technology into the market. Now, if you were to just look at the marketing sphere, there, there's thousands of different yeah. variations. But to operate in the financial planning sphere in Australia, you don't have thousands of of solutions that can actually operate. So it's, it's quite good that we're in a very small industry, but then it's about, okay, well, how do we bring the compliance team on the journey to trust technology? How do we do, bring the power planner to use the technology in a way that's conducive to their role? How do you bring a planner along to learn a new technology when they've been used to this for five to 10 years? So obviously learning is always the, the hardest part about embracing new technology. And so we really focus on that assistant journey in using a yeah. And I do think the more I speak to both, you know, lots of providers on the podcast, but also practices, one of the skill sets that I think is, and and fairly fair enough, but one of the skill sets that is a gap, I think, is compliance people and tech. I really do think that they've been running to keep up with the, their need to understand tech 
for their own confidence. Like that's, that's what it's really about is that they can get confidence out of technology that the job can be done really well. And in fact, it adds rigor rather than takes away. But I do get that comment a fair bit where, look, it's all great, but we can't get compliance across the line. You know, so I do think there's an evolution there that's going to have to happen just for that sort of part of the industry um, to really yeah, you know, sort of go and, with the flow. And just speaking on compliance, if, if you remember back to the Royal Commission, you didn't see any legacy software brought up. Yeah. You saw the SOA brought up. Yeah. You saw the fact file. You saw the file notes. Yeah. So the compliance focus is, again, we've got to bring the compliance team on the journey because they're very black and, black and white needed written down. Yep. But technology is just creating efficiency and automation around that written down process. So as long as the output matches the compliant framework, if you get there in one hour versus 10 hours but achieve the same outcome, as a planner or user, what would you prefer? Yeah. And so that learning curve for compliance to come into the tech realm, um, obviously, if you look at many reports um, out there, even the uh, power planning hub, at least mm-hmm. the power planning report, which said uh, one of the biggest confrontations uh, for power planners is technology and AI. Yeah. And so if you look at compliance, you've got companies like Fourthline. Yes. Fourthline can automate a lot of checks, but it doesn't replace that individual. Yeah. So it's it's a harmonization between people and tech that needs to occur and not be embraced with fear. Mm. So we found bringing those compliance people along the journey has actually been very productive. And when we open the doors and show them, great, well, this is how we manage the SOA within our system. This is how the data flows. It starts to go, okay, well, that's achieving our compliant outcome we need. So then they're like, okay, now we understand it a bit. It's just that yeah. mystery of that black box of how it gets there. Yeah. I think the other thing that I'm starting to realize too is, you know, when you look at human behavior, something that takes many hours to do, and you mentioned you have 10 to 12 hours, that's never going to be done in one sitting, right? That's probably going to be done over time, which increases the likelihood of errors. Every time you've got to go back in, revisit the thing you were thinking about and analyzing or doing, and you sort of start back where you finished, there's an opportunity to miss something, to, you know, go down a path you weren't going to go down. So I think, you know, us shortening the time isn't just about the time alone. It's reducing the opportunity for errors. You know, it's it's keeping it concise and top of mind. And and really, you know, thought process and critical thinking can do their best work when they're not interrupted. You know, <laughs> whereas the longer Completely something agree. takes to do, the more you get interrupted. You know, it's um. So I think all of that's really powerful too, and that's only good for compliance as well. You know, exactly. So one of the unique parts of Ascendia we made sure to incorporate is its dynamic nature. Right. So if you say, for example, answered something in a particular way in the fact find process it actually triggers certain actions to occur later on down the pathway as a result of how you actually answered something. Now, the way you undo that is you go, okay, well, we can't answer the new part we want to answer because we haven't collected information back here. So it creates that that channel or that pathway where you can check the flow. So we've built it with guardrails in mind to limit that potential human error by providing a guided framework. Um, It works for some planners, doesn't work for others. Um, you can have an open technology system where it lets you do everything, but that usually then does come with errors. So well, if you're looking at a CRM open, yeah, of course, but if you look at when it comes to advice production, um, that's your biggest PR risk right there. Look, and I think the other thing is that the most technical and skilled people all use, because what you're essentially talking about is is the computerization of checklists. I mean, that's a lot of what this is, right? It's a way to go down a path. That's what guardrails provide is, is nudging you, keeping you on path or, or turning you that way because this thing happens. You know, it's that sort of thing that's a prompt and a reminder. And um, I don't know whether you've read the checklist manifesto, but but that was actually the, you know, this, these insights came from surgeons and pilots and the errors that were massively reduced and the lives saved by them just using checklists, like just things that created structure and took them down certain paths. And that's what it sounds like you guys are doing. You're just putting that, you're automating that for people. You know, you don't need to have this thing printed out where the power planner makes sure they do this, this, and this that's embedded in the system, you know? And so that's always a good thing. I think we can, we can probably overcomplicate or feel like things are more complicated than they need to be. There's actually only so many permutations of advice. There's a lot, don't get me wrong, but it's not actually that many, you know, and so that's how you can build these tools. You know, exactly. I think the main permutations is not so much the strategy itself, but it's how the strategy is worded, how it's explained, right. how it's related back to the goal or the client situation. 
So a super consolidation is always going to be a super consolidation. Mm-hmm. But why? What is it? What's happening? What are the risks? Why is it in the best interest? Yeah. That that wording needs to be adaptable to the individual client and also how a planner verbalizes it. So to that point, like let's talk about that, right? Because advisors are demanding souls. I've put myself in that category too. But I like to write it this way and I like to – how do you guys handle that there are thousands of us that all want things different ways? How do you cope with that? Yeah, so back when we first launched um, our, our system, like um, in 2021, what we found was people wanted integrations. So we yep. did integrations. And then planners wanted SOA configuration, but they wanted it at such a, a deep level down to an individual sentence and how that sentence is structured and what variable is within that sentence. So we went away um, at the start of this year and actually started building what we've dubbed the statement of digital advice. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a new way to actually manage documents for both licensees or planners. We've built it in such a way that when I actually show it to planners, it's in Excel, not Word. Okay. And so... What we've done is we've been able to break down all the strategies, bids, uh, risks and warnings into a specific structure. We've then built our own custom little black box uh, Mm -hmm. with our own unique code, which interprets the data and builds the SOA for you based on the user's login and the client's personal data. So this allows the individual planner or user to change every sentence, every variable, every word within a strategy heading, within a strategy itself, to how they want it and under what conditions they want it. And so this is now a simple process for us to do over a period of two to four weeks. Yep. And when you want to manage it or change it, it's simply we just update a a cell in an Excel sheet. Now, it was quite – when I presented it to one planning group, um, they said we provide very unique advice. We want it in a very particular way. How are we going to cater to that as our legacy system Mm -hmm. is quite challenging cost. So I put up the Excel sheet and I said, what do you want the strategy? Type, type, type. It's now changed. How do you want your strategy worded? Type, type, type. It's now changed. That'll be up in an hour. Yeah. So that, the methodology that we built means that SOA management, personalization and customization is now much, much easier to an individual planner level. Yeah. Okay. And so, you know, something like duration becomes a thing and they want to make sure that there's a section in one of the fund recommendations that's specifically talking about fixed interest funds and then that's something that's easy to do it can then be applied across the business but at least it's can be defined by the practice or even by the advisor is that am i interpreting okay fantastic great so you don't have to have long-winded word documents that are hard-coded or code in the word documents right if you've ever tried to extract your document from a system and it's just covered in code (laughs) that doesn't happen with Ascendium because we do it this particular way with our new soda system or statement mm-hmm. of digital advice. It's just a straight through ease of data. And so what this means is that we can plug our soda system into not only Word documents to be populated, but digital screens. So okay. if you have um, a digital tool where you want to provide the advice through a portal, this yep. can directly feed into that portal, provide that advice on screen. It's actually easier to do that than it is Word documents. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, and that's of course where a lot of a lot of the work's going, isn't it? It's it's providing Correct. it so that people can interact with it digitally anyway. Um, that's exciting. All right. So you mentioned before, look, some some power planners or advisors react well, and some don't. Talk me through that. So so when you guys engage with a practice, what are the ones that just get it? It works. They're seeing value, and it's all like this. Versus what are the ones where it's like, oh god, this is torturous. Do you, is there a theme there? Is there sort of, some sort of challenge you commonly hit? Yeah, so what the common challenge we hit is when a planner sees the advice or, or how the system operates, it's new to them. Right. Because within their traditional practice, it's the admin or power planner that's doing this physical work of getting the quotes, inputting the data, completing the research. Right. So a planner's going, well, I have to do this, but that's not how it works. The planner could use a Sendium or the admin could use a Sendium or the power right. planner could use a Sendium or your virtual assistant could use a Sendium. Yeah. So where we found most success is the businesses that have a VA or an admin or a power planner internally, we say, just give it to them. <laughs> you step back, you do what you're great at, which is engaging with your clients, providing the right advice, and let your admin and power planners who do this day in, day out, who are familiar with technology, familiar with CRMs, data entry, use the technology as it's intended. Mm. And we found that businesses that had done that 
Um, one business in particular has decreased their time from 10 to 16 hours to provide holistic insurance advice down to one hour and 10 minutes. Oh. So oh. It, it, it's quite exciting that it's <laughs> yes. gotten down to that. It's taken them three months to really figure out how they use it for their business because mm-hmm. you can use the Sendium any way that, that fits your purpose. And it's quite interesting. They brought in an external power planner, came and joined their business, and they the power planner's first go was one hour, 10 minutes. That's and fantastic. She said it would have taken four to five hours using the traditional legacy system to achieve the same outcome. Yeah. So that's what we're really focused on. Like, give it to the right people mm. and, and let everyone do what they're good at. Plan is great with clients. Admin's great at data entry. Plan is great as power plan is great at strategies. Like, we've just signed our first power planning business as well to kick off the year. Fantastic. So they're using Ascendium for their IFA businesses to actually improve the turnaround. So if, if you think of the traditional turnaround of five to 10 days, mm. uh, the power planning business, TNW Power Planning Solutions, is now going to be receiving access to Ascendium, able to produce advice, and they'll be doing that on the Inzumo templates as well. So for those not familiar with Inzumo, they're, they're a great organization which works with lots of licensees to provide SOA templates regularly updated so it keeps it compliant, right. which yep. is the core. And they also do explant workflow. So we now have access to the Inzumo templates, which if you're not an explant user, you can use. Mm-hmm. And you can access that quality control. So uh, working with that power planning business is looking to be very excited for us. And we have more joining our community shortly. That's great because I think, um, and and what I'm hearing of what you're saying is, is something I believe too, is there's too many advisors that change the oil as well, well as drive the car. You know, like it's like we, we've got to let other people do other elements, even if they do the first four in the system and then the advisor steps in at some point, that's okay too. Like take advantage of your teams to give you that bandwidth because it's just ridiculous for us to be doing it all ourselves. And like you say, most of them are better at it. <laughs> like we're actually no good at this stuff. So let the people that, you know, what I find, think in boxes and arrows. They think in this sort of behavior anyway. It's quite intuitive to them. Um, and, you know, it can make a huge difference. Like you're saying, I mean, the we talk about accessibility of advice, but going from, let's call 10 hours down to one and a bit. I mean, even if it was 10 down to two, this is massive. Like that's a massive difference, you know. So um, this is where we can really, you know, that's the first step. I mean, I'm a big believer that there's a big second one too that's about making admin easier too. Uh, there's some work to do there uh, as well. Stay tuned <laughs> on that. We're working on some things. Yeah, well, and it's necessary, right? Because I think, you know, we could all work together and build a Formula One car, but if it ends up running on a pothole driveway, <laughs> then, it, you know, it's no good. And that's the challenge when we hit platforms is often we've hit the potholes. Um, and so, you know, our great tech system suddenly isn't as great after all, or it is, but it just can't go as fast as we want it to. So, yeah, I'm with you there. We've got to get all parts of the process streamlined. And I think we can really deliver some great, um, you know, some great advice to, to far more people. So then it sounds like um, somebody that's curious, you know, having a good think about their process and really understanding the way they're currently doing things and who's doing what clearly will make a difference when they then start to talk to you. Is there anything else you'd recommend they do before they embark on using a tool like Ascendium? If you're with a licensee, check with your licensee. Yeah. So what when I was with my licensee, you couldn't use anything but what they approve. And so I'm seeing the emergence of two different styles of licensee. One progressive, one legacy. The legacy usually sticks to that closed ecosystem of only X or yep. Y or Z. Whereas the progressive goes, okay, well, what do you need, Mr. and Mrs. Plan Art, to actually be good at your job? What caters or works for you as an individual business? Because no two businesses are alike. So the first thing I would say is if you're with a licensee, check with your licensee about tech approval process, what is needed, is the SOA able to be provided, um, what is, do they have a pilot program? What's their tech approval process? Because you'd be surprised some licensees don't actually have an approval process. Yeah. They make the decisions on how they believe it should be run, not how the plan is needed to be run, if that makes yep. sense. So yep. I'm finding more, the more progressive licensees having conversations with yep. their planners and, and designing the framework. So if you're an IFA, it's a bit different. So if you can make a decision on your own tech, the first decision to make is, do you have your own SOA 
and how regularly is it updated. Yeah. Now, that's not just important for a management of an SOA process, but the compliance of an SOA. Yeah. So if you're not regularly updating that SOA, um, so again, I'll touch base on the Power Plan Hub Power Planning Report. One of the biggest challenges they found in that report with the IFAs was the SOA wasn't regularly updated. Yeah. So if you're not regularly updating your SOA, it then is not more not conducive to actually providing that compliant high quality advice. Yeah. So are you set to that SOA or do you want to switch to an Enzumo SOA, which is regularly updated and managed by their compliance and available day one? Yeah. So yeah. it's about making a decision of which SOA do you want and then that assists in the process. So the other ones I'll probably suggest is what research tools are you using? Yep. So we have a very strong relationship with Product Rex and Nick, and, and mm-hmm. what he is doing is something we heavily support and encourage. <sighs> yes. Um, I know you had him on the podcast recently. Can't speak highly enough about Product Rex. <laughs> Me uh, either. It's transformed us in the business, I've got to say. Exactly. So we, we've we made sure we've built an incredibly deep integration, uh, two-way data flows very seamlessly between the systems. And with updates and the communication between Product Rex and Ascendium, it means that we both grow mm. as technology together. Uh, we also have a deep two-way integration with Omnium, so you yep. have that insurance research capability. So one of the unique parts of the integration is if you were to add a load-in in Omnium after you produce Ascendium, it will come back and add that load-in into Ascendium for you in the correct area okay. or vice versa. So that, that two-way updating mechanism reduces human error Yep. so you don't miss adding something. So decide if you're going to use product recs or if you're going to use something else. Mm-hmm. So those integrations do achieve that efficiency that you're looking for, and yeah. they do have very good data uh, that they do provide. Yeah, and look, the the integrations are so interesting, and Product Rex and, and yourselves are great examples of how um, how, how the advice tech space has, has changed so much in the last. It's, I mean, it's really only four to five years, not even really, because you know, there's historically it really truly has been these massive guerrilla systems. You know, it's just always. It, and if somebody competes, they just build another gorilla system <laughs> to try and compete. Whereas what's clear is you can now select, you know, deep and really powerful tools to solve that problem, you know, that step or that element. And when they talk to each other, then you can start to really get cooking. You know, like I think I find that exciting because I think that lets you solve the biggest problem you have right now. And that's going to be different in each practice. You know, it truly, some people, you know, really will need what, what you guys provide, like that. We need to go from 10 hours to what that would be fantastic. That will make a world of difference. Others might have had so much pain with a sort of analysis tool or, or research tool that, you know, Nick has a product Rex that that will make the first biggest bit of difference. But, you know, giving us freedom to choose where we start with that, I think is, is how the world changed. And I agree with you, you know, the legacy dealer groups, I think they're going to struggle because when you are so rigid about that stuff, you only get little increments of improvement. You know, you only save the 10 minutes here and the 30 minutes here. You don't save these huge quantums of time and energy and value. Yeah. Um, So I like to, when when we were building this system, um, I'm incredibly OCD by nature uh, mm -hmm. for those that are close to me. So um, William and I were timing every micro efficiency that mm-hmm. we're saved from every bit of automation. And, and simply um, in our file note system, having a box to confirm what ID was collected and whether right. it was certified or what can save 20 seconds. Yeah. It takes two seconds to input, but it saves 20 seconds if you were to traditionally type that sentence. So we then broke down the entire system into fact-based or qualitative-based um, data. Mm-hmm. So if it's fact-based, if it's black or white, yes or no, you yep. can automate that, but if it's more contextual, sentimental, qualitative, based on conversation, we don't. So if you take that uh, thought process of 1% improvement per day, mm-hmm. you just improve four minutes per day and, and you're starting to get on that efficiency gain. Mm-hmm. And if you do that over a whole year, that's where you look at that 10 hours down to one to two hours. Exactly. And it's, it is all in the little things. I mean, I mean, you talked about the data and, and having to repeat entry because the, the issue there just isn't, isn't only the mistakes. It's the fact you've t- got to take the time to re-enter. Like that's just, you know, and that's morale destroying too. You know, so sp- support staff can be some of the most downtrodden people in our teams because they've got to do all this crappy stuff, you know. So there's so much value and energy you can get out of using these tools well as, 
you know, with your team. And I really think, um, you know, we can sort of lift. We've all probably been a bit exhausted by everything that's been going on. And I think when you pick the right tools, then the team's energy really lifts, which is exciting, uh, really exciting. Now, in terms of the client, I always ask about, you know, is there any elements of the tool that sort of brings the client closer to the advisor or, you know, enhances the client experience? Is there anything in particular that Ascendium does in that respect or is it really sort of behind the scenes purely for the advice production? The easiest way I can explain it is if you look at an iPhone, all your apps are your client facing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The iOS is what's happening on the back end, making it work. Mm-hmm. And so Ascendium is just operating quietly in the background of your business, just powering it, getting that efficiency, turning advice out the same day, making sure it's consistent, compliant, it's within the guardrails, and you can then get that back faster to the client. Oh, perfect. So no client engagement um, on, on outrage. Directly. Yep. Yep. Perfect. So in terms of current users you've got, um, then, you know, is there any features that you you sort of look at what people are using and you go, I can't believe people aren't using more of this thing, like they've sort of not quite got there yet? Is there anything that stands out for you within Ascendium that you feel like the current users could, could get on the bandwagon of? Yeah. So we developed this section called Exploration. So as, as for more of um, that, that story-driven advice. So mm-hmm. what I mean by that is, what you would traditionally put into a file note or what compliance uh, would ultimately want you to have as context uh, context for the advice you're providing, we've put in yep. this exploration. Now, this exploration is broken up by scope, by client, by area. Um, for example, if you're going through the retirement, it asks questions about, well, what is the, how do they describe their ideal retirement? This then becomes data within the system that can be repurposed into a fact into the fact find to mm-hmm. say this is more context or into the SOA. So it gives us more data to actually more personalize the, the advice that's being created. Yeah. Um, you could even go down into um, the insurance section, which is quite detailed. If you were to be TPD, would, would your partner become a carer? Yes, right. no, part-time, full-time. That then adds further questions. So it morphs through a whole chain or a spider web based on how you answer the previous questions and mm-hmm. it just adds further context. So that's something that I, I don't see an enormous amount of planners using, but I see that over time they will slowly become more open to using that yep. as that data once in Ascendium can then be sent wherever you need it to go. And is part of the reason for that that perhaps um, advisors are using this as a after the fact rather than during the fact. So, like, so if they're talking to a client, are many advisors actually entering stuff straight in or are they taking their notes and then transposing? How's that working in terms of the process? Yeah, so some planners use it while they're on the phone with the client. Yep. Some use it after the fact. Um, the majority of planners use it after the fact and they just go in and input that information. So that's why it's not heavily used. Yeah, uh, but we're exploring ways to make it more available to the planner to make available to the consumer, so that he can get that additional contextual information. And sometimes there's even a halfway, isn't there? That's almost like a um, a scripting tool for the advisor to use as their entree in as they're talking. You know, like it, it. You know, I've seen some powerful things outside our industry that do that. That just sort of, you know, you've designed your path and the way you have a conversation, and it just lets you collect that information as you go, you know, and and yes, the client could have answered those questions, but you also can just enter that information as you go, you know, and Correct. so that's possible. Yeah. So if you see new entrants to the market, like I remember when I was first starting, you you would sit in on a meeting with a more experienced planner, and you're like, how do you know to ask that? And in that order, how do you know that was going to yeah. be a follow up question? And then. As you become more experienced, you go, okay, I'm starting to understand the flow. So another added benefit is um, we've just finished a, a program with the university in Australia, their Masters of Financial Planning, and we found that the students were able to pick up a system within 45 minutes. And the exploration was something that provided them a guide right. on what to do. So when they eventually enter the field, they'll be like, oh, wait, I remember these questions. These are some things I have to cover. Yep. And it's also... Um you know, scripting, people are always nervous about that stuff because they think it makes it stilted. But anybody who's ever had to start a new role and talk to people straight up really appreciates those sort of, even if it's not scripting, even if it's more choose your own adventure prompts, (laughs) um, it can be so powerful and it empowers you actually to engage because you worry less about looking down and checking the, oh, I've got to collect this and fill in this field. It's like I can just sort of follow the flow um, as we go. So, yeah, I mean, the combination of that and maybe 
maybe some voice typing and things like that, you know, it can become pretty easy then to start getting really good conversations happening that get captured really well, um, you know, as opposed to bullet points of dull information that you can't use in an SOA way to give real context. Completely you know? agree. Yeah, yeah, it's powerful. Now, let's talk about looking forward under insurance. I mean, <laughs> you know, we've all been so focused on a whole lot of things that, I mean, insurance has been around, but it's probably had a little less attention than some areas of advice, but we've all become abundantly aware of the fact that less advisors has also meant less insurance advisors, um, and there is so much under insurance. Is that something, you know, is that an area you guys are focusing on? Have you got some work that you're, so, or some things that you're going to be rolling out in, in that sort of space? Yeah, that's something that that's always been at the core of myself as a planner. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't know that I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease when I was mm -hmm. 17. And upon doing a lot of research about what options are available, how can I protect myself financially even when I was that young, it, it highlighted that child trauma right. could have assisted. I was like, well, who would have done that? Where could I have obtained that? And it was from a planner. Yeah, And that's what really sent me on the path going, well, if I can help people not be in the same situation, then that's something I want to do. So when I became a planner, insurance was a very key focus for me, for every client I worked with, with my particular target demographic. Mm -hmm. And so that's also been a core part of Ascendium. So we've been working with a flagship business of a major insurance licensee for over a year now. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that have really provided constructive, great feedback, which we've implemented into Ascendium. So yeah. we've structured the Ascendium in ways that they haven't been able to do things previously in other systems, which has made it so we can get that time down to around an hour and 10 minutes. So the capability for them to follow a process that's guided, that they know where it's going to go, that produces yeah. consistent SOAs has, is what's achieved their results. We're, we've also been piloting our insurance needs automation. Mm -hmm. Now, this is... It's not available to everyone. We're just still beta testing this. But this operates under the premise that if a planner sits down with a the client, they go, okay, well, you need to know the age, the family structure, the income status, assets, liabilities, how they plan on what they plan on doing if they get sick, ill, where they want the children to go. Yeah. So we've built functionality within Ascendium, which again, we're still evolving where you can analyze all this data that's been put into the system and it'll automatically populate an insurance needs analysis based on that client's individual circumstance. Yep. It saves you about 15 to 30 minutes. Yep. Um, just that that single function. But if you do that 100 times a year, mm -hmm. you, you see it start that, that one function starts to save an enormous amount of time. Yeah. And then that goes, okay, well, based on our rules, which are configured by the business, this is where we believe you should be. Let's have yep. a conversation about this and why. And we see this functionality alongside our insurance automation and specialization of that insurance module as something that could be used more by mm -hmm. insurance specialized planners or even planners looking to provide insurance advice. Yeah. Because it's been combined and designed with those great specialists in mind. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, if you're logging into Ascendium and you're using that insurance function, you know that some of the specialists were the ones that gave input to that. Right. So yeah. we try to build Ascendium as a collection of, of knowledge and expertise so that anyone that opens it up is going, great, well, this has got everything I do need, how I operate in a specialized manner. Mm -hmm. So this functionality, uh, the insurance automation, the one-hour insurance advice um, is something that I see even direct insurance providers, uh, given they have their own direct insurance arms, yep. can start providing holistic advice using the insurance engine, which is then quantifiable from a compliance metric. Yep. Um, and even if you don't want that insurance automation, then we just tick it off. But again, mm -hmm. still in beta testing, uh, but something that we're looking to roll out. Because I believe the FSC released a report, 15 million underinsured Australians. Yeah. Um, and so I know <laughs> what that is like to be on the receiving end. Yeah. Um, so that's not something that I want to see this, this country experience in the future. Right. And it is something that, um, you know, my background is, my, my degree had a... a focus of actuarial studies and and the thing that, that that sort of highlights is there is a lot of science behind this that can be applied. There is a lot of logic and formulas and structure and however to date insurance has had a lot of um magic that isn't quite science, if you know what I mean? Like everybody does it all these different ways and we've got all these and it's like oh, hold on. 
I think we can get more rigor to this. I think we can get more con- consistency for want of a better expression, which will mean also new entrants to the market, new young advisors can get trained better because there'll be some structure they can follow. There'll be some ways to learn. It isn't this never ending strange beast where they're never quite on top of it, you know, and I think anything that can help with that is so powerful. Um, because it is, it's insurance is really interesting because it is so analytical in the way that it's priced and the way all those sort of things. But, but advice, you know, it has really not quite got there for some time in the way that I know that individual advisors probably do provide that rigor, but in the way that we all approach it, it really is sort of a bit betwixt and between, um, in terms of consistency. So it's great to hear that you guys are sort of focusing on that and seeing how we can sort of bring some more structure, um, to that. Cause you're right. Anything formulaic, I mean, that's made for tech. You know, it's just anytime you do a calculation, that should be in technology, you know. like it's, Yeah, it shouldn't be a plan of whipping out a calculator no. to put it in. It should just appear on the screen. Correct, correct. It should be a given. I love it, I love it. So what else is on the development path? You know, what's is there anything that's sort of a bit further out that you're like, ooh, I'd love us to get there, you know, something that would be exciting that you'd love us in the end to ultimately get to? Yeah, so there's a couple of things we're working on. Um Obviously, given the quality of advice review and the possible re-entrance to the banks and then more exposure to super funds to win advice, mm-hmm. we've been trying to utilize the same guardrails and compliance framework that we offer with incredibly personalized um, advice through Ascendium mm-hmm. for that intra-fund advice or for that limited scope advice. So the scenario analysis that we've been running has been able to do intra-fund advice in about 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And from speaking to some funds, it's taken anywhere from four to five hours to do that intra-fund advice. And yep. if you're looking to say some supers have a million members. Now, imagine yeah. if you can go, hey, guys, here's a personalized insurance advice. Um, you just have to input some data. We'll run it through. We'll check it. You should definitely improve your under insurance. So right. trying to work with the, the banks and the industry funds when they re-emerge into this industry um, <laughs> and make sure they're equipped with highly efficient tools is one thing we're doing. Yep. Um, obviously, projections, um, that is one that really is only one player in the market controls all projections, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what we're seeing is companies like Voyant have, have taken out advice um, tools of the year in Canada for 2022, and, and they're mainly projection tools. Yep. So integrations with Buoyant is something that's on our horizon to make sure that you have that seamless flow, the two-way data flow, um, so you can do all your research and get your SOA, you do your projections, and it's all seamlessly connected. So we're working on that. Um, some other things we're working on, which I, I don't want to reveal too too soon, <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, hopefully here in about in the coming months. Exciting. And um, look, I'm curious actually on your view about projections. I've... Um Despite being having a background that's deeply analytical and and being able to prove the formulas you use for net present value and all that sort of stuff from my daggy degree, I've always struggled a bit with projections because in for you and I, a projection is something that we know is one line. You know, it's one example of a possible future and is just something that's like a guardrail. It's like a, well, it's it, it may get sorted to here. Whereas for the public, the minute they see something that's in a graph or in a table, it becomes sort of set in stone in their mind in that it's got certainty and reality because it's it doesn't say 1 million, it says 1,532,056 cents, right? So what's your view on the way we need to do that such that we can do the scenarios, we can get our, our feel for um, the possible wobble or change in, in a client's situation in the future, but how do we also represent that so it's it's able for them to be absorbed in the appropriate way and, you know, as a guardrail as opposed to a certain outcome? I think it always comes down to the compliance team. Mm-hmm. It's not really a plan as choice in, in how you do projections when, when you're working with a compliance team because they yep. want it to be assumed assumptions in a fixed format, not yep. stochastic. So whereas the difference when I speak to planners in the US, all of them use Monte Carlo analysis. Mm. So it gives you this wide range, certain ups and downs, certain recessions. There's all these variables they can plot in and they present that to a client as a possible future. Yeah. Up, down, wherever it could go. Whereas the projections we've done, it's that exact $342.53. Right. Yeah. And a consumer that will go, well, is that what I'm getting? And the answer is obviously no. Right. We can't predict the future. So I think 
the projections can only be expanded to be in that that varied analysis to show a, a length or a wave where you can actually go into uh, mm-hmm. when compliance um, actually opens up that realm. But yep. until that happens, obviously compliance is there to make sure everyone sticks within the regulation. Um, yep. So we have to follow what compliance is uh, given as instruction. Yeah, look, and it is... It is a challenge. And I think actually projections are interesting going forward because one of the things that surprised me about the education standards is that there wasn't a mathematics of finance subject put in. And to me, the minute you start doing projections as an advisor, you need to get all of that. And it's not something that's covered actually in any of the courses, Um, not in the way that makes you have the gut instinct for numbers. You know, like when you can look and go, oh, that one looks wrong. I need to, you know, I need to understand that because as you know, the power of tech is great, but also it's only as good as the inputs. And if we've got to have that gut instinct to be able to pick up when our inputs are wrong, you know, when we've messed something up. Um, yeah. So that'll be interesting to watch going forward. You know, is it, does it mean power planners become more analysts in that sense? Because they'll have great tools like yours to do the production and it becomes more about their analytical skills and the way they can do. I don't know. I'll be really interested to see how that evolves over time. Yeah, I feel power planners are, are going to become even more prevalent, but mm-hmm. it's making sure they're equipped with the right technology that assists them in doing their role. Yeah. Um, so if you look at how they normally perform as a fixed fee, and so the, you're going back and forward on projections or, or certain aspects as a business. So if, right. you, if you take a business perspective, for a power planner, the longer something takes, the smaller the margin or even a negative margin. Mm. So power planning in itself can almost be a loss-making game similar yeah. to dealer, dealer groups or financial planning businesses. You've got to look at it as a business. So the, unless we embrace automation, efficiency, technology, and having the right people doing yeah. it, like yeah. optimize where everyone's specialized, yes. that is not going to lead to any of those three parties being profitable businesses. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. Now, is there anything we've missed? We've covered a fair bit. Is there anything we've missed about Ascendium or what you guys are doing? Well, I think one of the, uh, speaking to a planner um, just last week, he's figured out a a nice little ninja hack in Ascendium. Oh, we love those. Uh, So I'm always amazed at the creativity of of planners and their power planners and admin or what they do. And so he's gone well, I just need the SOA. I don't need the fact find or the strategy bid paper because mm-hmm. I do that this way and I get my fact find from here. Yep. But I'm using Ascendium to get the SOA. And so within Ascendium, we've put in uh, red asterisks next to certain data points. Yep. And this was at the request of, ironically, this plan a little while ago, <laughs> um, that the red asterisks highlight what's absolutely needed to be populated in an SOA. Yep. So we provided a color-coded framework to, to go through Ascendium if you just want an SOA. Mm-hmm. So he gave me feedback that his power planners are doing going through Ascendium to get that SOA output in about 25 to 30 minutes. Yeah, okay. And so his internal power planners getting an SOA in 30 minutes, doing about 30 minutes uh, post-edit. Yep. And then getting it back to him. And that's down from six hours post-edit through his old system. And right. also using external services. So that that was quite interesting that he's utilizing those red asterisks to his uh, best capability. To, to speed things up or, or streamline them for them. And I, look, it's so, I I love it when we let systems loose on the teams, you know, because, because then, you know, they never follow that path where you go up here and you turn left. They're the ones that do the curved turn, right? They're like, no, 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 no. I don't need those 12 steps. I can go right over here. And that's what we need more of. You know, we need those shortcuts. We need to understand um, what can just streamline things because, you know, what you or I might come up with as, as a logical way to approach something won't be the way somebody else will, you know. So I love that you guys are listening to those sort of shortcuts or hacks and, and factoring things in because, you know, it'll add up. It'll add up to hours and hours of value. Um, so fantastic. Oh, that's a great tip. Um, all right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Ascendium, then the website link is in the episode show notes along with Scott's LinkedIn details. So I'm sure he'd be happy for you to poke him on LinkedIn. And, and he said it's on his phone. It's something that he looks at all the time. So he'll definitely point you in the right direction of, a, I'm sure, a member of the team that can, um, you know, get you up to scratch and, and get you moving. Thank you so much for joining us, Scott, and for really continuing to fight the good fight of making, you know, advice access- accessible to more Australians. 
Thanks, Peter. And thanks for running this amazing podcast as well. It's always informative and educational when I tune in. So thank, thank you, you so much. So are you a current user of Syndium? Is it something you've had a lot of experience with? You've got some tips and tricks or maybe you disagree completely with something we were talking about or love a particular feature of the app? Either way, please share your insights on the Ensemble community platform. We'd all love to hear your take. And this sharing like this is how we're all going to get a better handle on how we build our tech stacks. Um, And so we all don't have to do the same research over and over again. I'm hoping episodes like this will help you get across new technology. But next layer is hearing how other people have used it and succeeded or even struggled when implementing the tech. So other than that, my thoughts here. Ascendium is one of those apps, and we're getting more and more of these coming out in advice tech, that sort of falls into the category of best for you tech stack design style, right? So what I mean by that is it's not in the gorilla category, which is the one big text system, you know, and it sort of tries to do most things, right? And that's that can suit some people. Um, alternatively, it's about this um, cobbling together the tools you want to use for your business. And the reason I don't use the expression best of breed for designing that tech stack is because what you think is the best thing for that particular function that you need may not be what I think is the best thing because I'm designing it for my either client experience or my user experience with my team and you're doing it for your client experience and user experience. So really it's down to what's best for you and how they can all integrate together. Um, And what I love about having more tools like Ascendium that fit into that and happily integrate with other tools is the freedom it just gives advice practitioners to improve and streamline where they choose to start for their practice, right? Where they choose to start transformation and improvement in their systems and processes, you know, and therefore what results they are striving for, which are all going to be different for all of us. And I think that's pretty cool that we're now getting to the point that there's enough of these options that we can all really work hard on a different part of the advice process, the way we do things and, you know, get really happy about the results we deliver. And I also love that, you know, this is an advice tool that's, you know, designed different windows into the tool for users based on their specific role. Um, now, this is just something I've learned the hard way. User experience is incredibly important for the success of a new tech tool getting taken up by your team. Uh, if the user experience isn't any good, then they're just not going to take it up. And it wouldn't matter if it could deliver hours and hours of benefit and efficiency if it's difficult to use or it's not got a smooth process for them so that they can pick it up really quickly, then it's just not going to work. So, you know, this is a great step to making the user or your team feel like the tool is actually designed specifically for them. That's when you get humming. And interestingly, you know, and this this is a bit of a theme of the last few episodes, here's another tool that's sort of building guardrails for advisors to step them through the advice production process. Now, you know, some of you listening may sort of rail against that. You know, you, you want full flexibility. I don't want to be nudged any particular direction, which I get. Once again, choice, all good. Um, but I think for a lot of us, you know, this type of guardrail process can really improve the rigor of the way we pull together advice um, and really streamline things for team members who are pulling it together on on our behalf. Um, Now, the other bit that's interesting here, and we're going to see more and more of this, is, you know, they've taken the time to incorporate or allow us to incorporate those great stories we use, the wonderful descriptions to describe a particular strategy or a topic or financial literacy issue um, that we might put in our advice documents and normally we'd have to sort of dump them in ourselves. They clearly, you know, tools like Ascendium are working to help advisors bring together all of that great storytelling into advice documents and even digital advice documents. So this is what's going to connect us better to to the public. So I'm loving that we're seeing that more and more out there. now. As you know, there is only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that's avid curiosity. And so normally, 
in the curiosity corner section of the episode, I would be trying to highlight something that I would expect you may not have come across before, right? So to, to help build that curiosity muscle. Uh, instead, what I'm going to do this episode is talk about something that you know, you'd have to have been asleep for four months to miss, which is chat GPT. Uh, now, I'd encourage you to, if you haven't actually come across it or haven't really dug into it at all, um, then just Google chat GPT. It's all one word. Um, and to find out more about it. Now, interestingly, what I've done is I've had a look in for a little while now. Um, and I actually typed into the tool, this AI tool, and asked it, what is chat GPT to just see what it'd come back with? Uh, and basically what it's saying is it's a tool, it's a conversational language tool, right? So it's actually sort of designed or naturally fits conversational applications with AI, such as chatbots or virtual assistants and things like that. So that's sort of where it, I guess it started. But of course, what's happened is once they release something like this, then the world gets a hold of it. And everybody goes nuts, right? Because it's AI, it's learning, it's, it's, um, able to come up with, you know, summaries or it can, you know, bullet point down a meeting, you know, meeting minutes you've got or it, like there's all these things that people are now using it for. Um, of course, anytime there's something new, then we, we can be fearful of about what it should or shouldn't be used for. And naturally, uh, in financial advice, then of course, we're, we're, all worried about somebody typing in, you know, should I make a contribution into super or should I um, put my money into a term deposit or something like that, right? And so what was interesting is after my first qu question, I then asked asked it, when should chat GPT not be used? Um, and it said, chat GPT should not be used in situations where accuracy and trustworthiness of information is critical, such as in medical, legal, or financial advice. Now, isn't that interesting, right? So it's the three things it's, it's specifically talking about, um, you know, because it's machine based model. And I think it's really important to understand where it's getting its insights from. Um, you know, it's developed by OpenAI. AI and it's trained on text from the internet. And we all know the internet's just full of truth, isn't it? I mean, there's nothing misleading at all in the internet. So naturally, it's sort of, I mean, the way I sort of think about it is it's it's using an average of the internet, right? It's sort of trawling through and go, gee, what's the average of what everybody's saying? And so that can mean it can have inaccuracies, it can have biases, it can be out of date. It can even include even offensive stuff, you know, whatever, whatever the average um, is across everything. And so it's even saying it should be used with caution and with a critical eye. And so, you know, I think I would encourage you to play that same game if you've never used Chat GPT before. But I thought we could do something together, a little bit of homework for this week, this week's episode. And I'd love you to, if you haven't before, just set up a Chat GPT login and then let's ask it what tech we should use as advisors and let's just see what it tells us i typed in what are the t what are the top systems and apps an advisor in australia should be using in their practice and it came up with a very concise list of 10 um, and at the end, interestingly, said note that the specific systems and applications used by an advisor may depend on the size of their practice, the services they offer, and their individual preferences, which is something we talk about a lot, don't we, on the podcast. Now, I'm looking now at the list it's given me, and there's some that, are, that make a perfect sense, um, that absolutely are one of the things, top things that advisors use, Microsoft Office Suite. Well, that seems logical, um, you know, and some usual top of the pops. But interestingly, there's a whole lot there that I think, wow, that's way out of left field. So it's looking through just what's available on the internet. And this is what it's coming up with. So I think this is a fun exercise. I'd love you to do the same. Ask it about the top systems or the top tech or the top, what's the top 10 advice tech tools that advisors should use in Australia, right? The more specific you get in the question, the better the answer you get. Um, and then I'd love you to go onto the Ensemble community and share them. Tag me in your post and share what came out of it. And let's all have fun playing with this tool and just get used to it so that we can start to see how it might be utilized in our businesses. It may just be something internal. It may be coming up with bullet points for blogs that we expand on. There's all sorts of ways we can use it. But for those of you that haven't started yet, make this the moment that you just check it out and have a look uh, and we can do that together. Welp. 
That's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And just like last week, I'd really love to hear what session or webinar or masterclass you would love me to run in the future. You know, is there a how-to session that you feel would add a whole lot of value? Or maybe there's a particular section of advice tech. This could be, say, something like client portals. You would like me to run an, an introductory web on, webinar on, say. You know, what do you want to learn more about? How can I add value in this sort of advice tech business transformation space? I want to hear all about it, whatever you feel you need help on. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn um, at PeterMD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.